The great architect Gottfried Bohm was born on January 23, 1920. He is a contemporary German architect and the only German to receive the Pritzker Architect Award. In the same year he was born, another project was underway that needed a great architect in its own right to build a league that would soar to new heights. This project was the NFL, and today is September 18th, 2019, which means Gottfried Boom and the NFL are now both 99 years old. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, we're back again September 17th, 1920, and we're in Canton, Ohio. And I'm sure you know what we're here for. Or do you? Because it's not what we think. The reason why we're here is because it is a significant day for the NFL and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But it is not what we think. The founding of the NFL. The reason why we are here is because the guy that stole the show on September 17th, 1920 in Canton, Ohio, that we would be looking at 100 years later and have no idea about, was a signing the Canton Bulldogs signed the All-American tackle, Wilbur Pete Henry, a behemoth of a man to join Jim Thorpe's professionals. Yes, Jim Thorpe's professionals, the Canton Bulldogs. And it would be on the front page. According to the Pro Football Hall of Fame site, his bio on Pete Henry, the Canton Repository the next day headlined the signing of Pete Henry as a superstar signing. But as we all know, There was another story, just a wee bit of significance in the NFL and the history of America, but it was buried on page three of the Canton Repository. The Canton Repository, that's a newspaper for you guys. They didn't have TV back then. They didn't have podcasts. They had to get their news from these things that would crumple in your hands and there's little black ink on them. For those of you that are eh, my age and younger, why don't you go ahead and look it up in the Smithsonian. Maybe you'll find it there. But just like a movie, there were major things going down around a fellowship, if you will. Little did the world know the fellowship would save the world. Now, what if I told you that there was a fellowship back in 1920 or maybe another time in the movies that was in the midst of pain and turmoil? But yet, like I said, they were going to save the world. This fellowship brought together representatives from many walks of life and region. A wizard was a leader. A man known as Strider was supposed to be the king, but he lived as a loner. An elf that was essentially immortal. A dwarf and a valiant warrior. Then, there were a group of hobbits. This group was tasked by uniting together, forgetting their differences, and to succeed. The ultimate prize of destroying this ring. A little ring. The one ring. Yeah, I know. You're all thinking, my precious. And there's a large enemy force that is looming around the corner. That large enemy force in our story for the NFL is college football, Major League Baseball. Everything else that's taking Americans' money, taking their eyeballs, and taking their hearts and dreams away from professional football. Just like Sauron did, ripping into your soul and taking it out. And the fate of entire Middle Earth was up to this ragtag group of nine people called the Fellowship of the Ring. Likewise. Professional football was in the same situation. It was hanging in the balance. The fate of professional football was almost destroyed. But there was a group that had to form to defeat this enemy, create their own fellowship. It would be a league, an organization, something that everyone could follow the same rules to create professional football. Not to create professional football in a sense, but it was a way to create a league for professional football teams to all be on the same path. But going back to the Canton Repository, Wilbur Pete Henry stole the headline. Sure, at the time, he was a behemoth of a guy, all-American tackle, and yes, he would end up in the Professional Football Hall of Fame. But another event was even more important that day, but nobody knew about it. Just like the Fellowship of the Ring and Lord of the Rings back there in Rivendell, a lot of people, most people, had no clue what was going on. In the home of the elves, 
a sacred place. But for the NFL, Rivendell, this sacred place, is Canton, Ohio, the home of the Hall of Fame. Which brings us back to September 17th, 1920. Again, this story was buried on page 3 of the Canton Repository. It was the founding of the American Professional Football Association, later to be changed to the National Football League. This is why Canton is NFL's Rivendell. Yes, the founding of the NFL was overshadowed by not an insignificant signing, but just a signing of one individual, Pete Henry. Like I said, though, again, big dude, a star, but it goes to show you how much of a leap of faith it was for the founders on this historic night, because they saw the future. The introduction, we talked about 99-year-old Gottfried Bohm, how he is an architect, building these beautiful, elaborate, pristine buildings. And today, September 18th, is the official next day of the 99th birthday of the NFL. But this baby, this tiny little NFL baby, super innocent, had no idea to what extent and heights this baby would reach? How much this baby would have as an impact on Americans, on their lives, not just for an entertainment purpose, but to be able to get them through the tough times? We talked about last week, September 11th. How did the NFL help? How does the NFL still help people remember? It all started back September 17th, 1920, and just like Godfrey Boom, the NFL is 99 years old. It's an organization that is so magnificent, and it would ultimately become the most powerful and popular and greatest sport in the greatest country on earth, just like many of Godfrey Boom's buildings over there in Germany. Now, we're talking about the beginning, though. September 17th, 1920, this is the beginning of the Roaring Twenties, baby. World War I had just ended not too long before then. And according to History.com, now these are some staggering numbers. During World War I, more than 9 million soldiers lost their lives. 21 million more were wounded. And at least 5 million civilians were dead from either disease, starvation, or even exposure during the war. Now, that's worldwide, but still. That's some devastating numbers. 35 million people affected. But it wasn't just 35 million. It was entire countries, entire world, basically. At the time, it was known as the war to end all wars. But we found out that would not be so. Just like the Battle of the Five Armies in The Hobbit did not end the wars in Middle Earth. And pro football was the same. This fellowship. These guys coming together. Ralph Hayes, Hupmobile Auto Showroom. Pro football was in disarray just like the continent of Europe was. I mean, teams were coming and going, losing money out of the teams. They kept shutting their doors. There was no organization until a hero would step up. Yeah, we can go ahead and say, I'm using quotes here, a wizard with a vision. You know who I'm talking about, Mr. Gandalf. Ralph Hay was that hero from the Canton Bulldogs, and he had enough. He said, we need to band together, just like the Fellowship of the Ring. And lest we not be scared of these powerful, towering giants known as the college football ranks, Major League Baseball, and everything else taking away Americans' eyeballs. And more importantly, the cheddar coming out of the American pockets. We as a professional organization can rise above and we can beat them out. Now, they didn't know this at the time, of course. There's no way they could have even envisioned. But they still got together. And they believed something had to be done. And he had other members with him. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Just like in 1920 when the government officials around the world trying to figure out how do we get back to the point this war never happens. The war to end all wars. They developed the League of Nations. Arguably it worked to a degree, but also arguably it didn't work to plan. So what side of history would Ralph Hay and all these other owners that are going to be joining in his automobile showroom have in 20 years after the meeting? How about 100? I mean, we have the benefit of hindsight because this is the 100th season of the NFL. So we know that what they did, the groundwork they laid, obviously worked out. But it wasn't September 17, 1920 that necessarily initially set the groundwork. August 20th, again with Ralph Hay in his auto showroom, but this time it is up in his office. 
this was the preliminary meeting, really set the ground rules. And a lot of the work was done at this point in time. It wasn't really September 17th, 1920, when they decided to create all the different rules. They were just agreeing on them and ratifying them. August 20th really was a preliminary meeting that set the groundwork, poured the mortar, if you will, to build the building that was and is and will forever be the NFL. But of course, we get to the big meeting. September 17th, 1920. The birth, the founding, the glorious rising of the NFL. And speaking of that meeting, the Pro Football Hall of Fame has the original meeting notes that were typed up on Akron Professional Football Team letterhead. Now, I I went and put a link to this article in the show notes for you, so you can go ahead and check it out, which, by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes well each and every week. But speaking of that document, this document, the one that I talked about on Akron Professional Football Team's letterhead after the meeting, you know, the league meeting notes, it was known as the NFL's birth certificate. This meeting, Ralph Hay, the owner of the Canton Bulldogs and the current reigning champion of the Ohio League, would pull together representatives from 11 franchises in his Hupmobile Auto Showroom because they didn't have enough room up in his office for a moment that at the time would seem like just a regular, hot, muggy night in the middle of Ohio. But this would turn into the biggest sports league in American history. So why is this important? Why this meeting? Why bother? Why do they even have to come together to have a meeting to become what we're talking about, this great founding of the NFL? Well, professional football, man, that was not a deal. That was something that people just kind of, oh, I'll show up, I guess. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Oh, man, I guess we got to go because we said we go. Uh, Okay, we'll go. It wasn't like it is now crazed fans wearing their jerseys, painting their faces, all these other kinds of things, fantasy football. It was just another thing to do. Professional football was in disarray. Like I said before, teams losing money. Players jumping teams. They weren't even able to keep players' salaries from getting to the point where they were losing money. I mean, there wasn't all these TV revenues and merchandise and things. It was just seats in the seats in the butts and butts in the seats. And you got the concession stands. I don't even know if they had concession stands back then. We got to check that out. But players, they could just play for whoever was the highest bidder. This game here, that game there, I don't know, well, just whoever pays me the most. Also, they had college players that were still enrolled in school playing in pro games. So they had just so many problems. Professional football was not taken seriously. It was not, eh, for the lack of better terms, professional. And an article from Arash Mikazi via ESPN quoted an interview with Ralph Hayes' grandson. Dr. James Francis King, to kind of explain about the whole college players jumping around and all that kind of thing, it went as such. Joe Carr, who owned the Columbus Panhandles at the time, said in one year, Newt Rockney played his team four different times, with a different jersey each time. So that tells you just, hey, come on, man, I can see this guy. He played against me last week for a different team. But it was just the norm. But it was not good business practice for the owners, and that's why they kept losing money. That's why the teams kept folding. The league, well, call it a league if you will, the many leagues that popped up and went out like the fly of the night, it just was not going to survive if it kept going the way it did. I mean, college football still reigned supreme at the time, and many, if not most of the college players, they would opt not to play professional football, even if they were the best at what they did. It wasn't worth it to them. It was not lucrative. Who cared about professional football at the time? Nobody. Well, not nobody, but... Not that many people did. So we have all these different reasons why professional football needed some kind of guidance and organization and this visionary Ralph Hay to bring everybody together. And from Christopher Klein through thehistory.com, he quoted an article in Canton Repository from back in 1920 and explained the intentions of the meeting, the one in August. And the intentions were this. The goal of the new venture would be to raise the standard of professional football in every way possible, to eliminate bidding for players between rival clubs, and to secure cooperation in the formation of schedules. 
So let's do this, man. We've got 11 teams represented in a hizzy, in a house. First, we have Canton Bulldogs that came to this meeting. Uh, I mean, well, that's Ralph Hay and his team. So yeah, sure, they're there. Also, we had the Decatur Staleys, the Chicago Cardinals, the Akron Pros, the Cleveland Indians, the Dayton Triangles, the Massillon Tigers, the Hammond Pros, the Muncie Flyers, the Rock Island Independents, and the Rochester Jeffersons. I don't know if you caught all that, but again, I'll put it in the show notes for you. But we didn't hear any current NFL teams in there. I mean, we're talking about the 100th season of the NFL right now, and we don't even have any NFL teams that were there at the beginning? Well, au contraire, that's not entirely true, because I did mention the Decatur Staleys. Not too long after the league would be founded, they would move to Chicago. And then they would become the Chicago Bears. The Chicago Cardinals moved to St. Louis and now are the Arizona Cardinals. So there were actually two teams that were there that are still nowadays back from the original teams in 1920. For some reason, the Massillon Tigers, they never even played in the NFL. And I'm not sure why, but according to the Professional Football Hall of Fame website, it stated that the, basically the first order of business was to discuss the withdrawal of Massillon. So I'm like, why do, why are they even there? I mean, it's like, thanks for your time here, bro. Don't let the door hit you, you know, with a good Lord split you, that, that kind of deal. But uh, we'll, we'll figure that out at some point in time. And after the meeting, by the beginning of the season, there'd be four more teams joining the NFL. Well, wait, hold your horses, because the league was officially named the American Professional Football Association at this meeting. Later in 1922, it would be changed to the NFL. But these other four teams that were joined to round out for 14 total teams were the Buffalo All-Americans, the Chicago Tigers, the Columbus Panhandles, and the Detroit Heralds for, again, a total of 14 teams in the first season, the inaugural season of the National Football League, then known as the American Professional Football Association. It's time. We have an official league. Let's get things going. But not everything came out of the league that we have today. It would take a hundred years to get to where we are now. I mean, some of the things that didn't even come out of that league were scheduling. They didn't even have schedules. They're like, play against whoever you want. I mean, see if your grandma can pick up a flag football team and you can play against them. I don't care. We'll put it on the records. So it wasn't kind of <laughs> to the organization of what we have today and the predetermined schedules. Nowhere near that, but we at least had a group of teams that were banded together to defeat the enemy. Well, at the enemy of the times, college football, Major League Baseball, and all these other things. We were on our way. And this August 20th preliminary meeting that I talked about at the beginning, that were that was when many of the rules and regulations were really drafted up. So they just had to essentially vote and agree to them and that kind of thing. At the time, they would name Jim Thorpe the president. Of course, many thought that Ralph Hay seemed to be kind of the obvious choice as far as the administrative side to be the president, but he felt, as many others actually came around to, was, hmm, let's put Jim Thorpe, known as the world's greatest athlete, as a face of our league to try to give us some clout. And again, the meeting left a lot to be worked on over the next hundred seasons, but it was still the best chance that pro football had to becoming something special. And as we know, it sure did turn into something special. And we are in the 100th season of the National Football League. And it was the step, the first step, in the right direction to building a cohesive unit of teams. They had one goal in mind, creating the best sports league in the nation. And even though William Pudge Heffelfinger had no idea what he was doing back then, Pro football was actually born on November 12th, 1892, when Pudge was paid $500 and some stone-cold cash to play for the Allegheny Athletic Association for a single game. However, pro football may have been born on that day, but it was on that hot, muggy night in a Hupmobile Auto Showroom in Canton, Ohio, when pro football learned to walk. And everything that has been so insanely awesome after that has happened including the NFL currently being in its 100th season, is because Ralph Hay brought together 11 teams on September 17th, 1920. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude. 
and were able to gain some great iron knowledge nuggets of the magnitude of a single meeting in a Hupmobile Auto Showroom in the middle of Ohio. To learn more about this event, head over to thefootballhistorydude.com and make sure you subscribe and leave a rating and review for the show. Now next week, we're going to take a look at the original teams on the path to the first ever NFL champion. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs>